Father God, I thank you so much that you are a wonderful and powerful God and that you are with us no matter where we are right now, whether it be in our homes or here in the church building. Uh, we know, Lord, that you are with us, that you are with us and that you are continually ministering to our hearts. We know, Lord, that you are working even in our children's hearts. And God, we want to claim the promise that, that you that your promises extend out to our families, your covenant promises extend out to them. And so, God, we just want to lift up our families to you. Uh, we thank you that we have the technology to be able to uh, worship you together like this, but some of the families are going through difficult times, um, and the children are, are having, maybe having a difficult time sitting through the service. And so, Lord, we want to lift them up to you, and we ask that you would continue to work in each of these families, that they would be able to look to you, that they would be able to worship you, uh, even though uh, we're separated from each other, even though they're not able to be in their Sunday school classes. Uh, Lord, I pray, especially for the children, Lord, would you work in their hearts, that they would know you more, that they would understand your truth all the more, and even if they don't understand everything that's going on in the sermon, Lord, I pray that you'd be working through the parents, that the parents would be the ones to disciple their children, and that uh, you would use the parents, even though they may have a difficult time explaining uh, all the things that your truth speaks about. But Lord, I pray that you would use your parents to speak your words of truth into the children's hearts. And Lord, that you would cause your children to grow continually in your truth. And I pray that you would be with these parents and that you would be with these families. And God, that, that together as a family, that they would worship you. Lord, I pray for all of us that are coming before you today to worship you that you would make your presence known to us, that you would speak to us through your word. And I pray, God, that as we look to your word now, that you would be the one really uh, making your presence known to us wherever we are, that you would let us know, that you would show us, that you would make it known to us, that you are with us. And I pray that you would speak to us through your word for your glory, Lord. We lift this time up to you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we come to the last sermon of our series. We've been going through a series called Breaking Ground, and we've been going through a bunch of different stories in the book of Matthew uh, where we see a growing divide between Jesus Christ and other authorities out there. The other authorities include government authorities or religious authorities. And we see this growing divide, to, and, and there's this question that's being asked, who can we trust? Who do we want to follow. And today we will come to the conclusion of this series. And the question that we, we want to ask, uh, just even as we asked last week, uh, who will you put your faith in? Even if it's just a little bit of faith, you don't have to have a full understanding of uh, everything in the Bible. You don't have to have a full understanding of who God is. Um, and even if you're a Christian that's been a Christian for a long time, there may be a lot of, there may be a lot of distractions, maybe a lot of uh, reasons why we're distracted to maybe trust in ourselves. And we have to continue to ask this question, who will you put your faith in? Who will you trust? And even if it's just a little bit, that's enough because it's not about how big your faith is, just as was talked about last week but it's about who we put our faith in. And today the title is, The Sons Are Free. The Sons Are Free. And this is what we want to finish up our series on and to say that if you do put your faith in Jesus Christ, that you will be free. And so let's turn our books, our, our, books, our Bibles, to Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 22, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. And I want to encourage you guys, if you do have Bibles in front of you, whether it be in a paper format or electronic format, if you guys can open up your Bibles, that will be great. Uh, but if you don't have one, that's okay. We do have it on the screen here. Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 to 27. This is the reading of God's word. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the, collect the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, 
What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Amen. Have you ever felt the burden of someone's expectations? Let me ask that again. And as I do, take some time to think through that question. Have you ever felt the burden of someone's expectations? Whether it be a coworker, or your spouse, or your parents, maybe. Uh, when, whenever I think about expectations, and especially about the relationship between parents and children, um, and I and I hear this question: Have you ever felt the burden of someone's expectations? I hear like a teenage voice, a teenager saying something like, "Why? Why do we have to do it that way?" It's just this uh, complaining and questioning type of voice. Why? Why do we have to do it your way? Or maybe, maybe some of us, we, we have that kind of thought, and maybe we don't express it in that kind of way, but especially during this time where the coronavirus has been going on all around the world, and the, gov- the government has shut the borders, no one is allowed, if that's not a Taiwanese citizen or holds an ARC card, they're not allowed in to the country. And there are all these different regulations that we have. Every time you have to go into a restaurant, you have to get your temperature checked or you have to get your hands sprayed. And maybe some people, as we see in places like America or other places around the world, may be responding with that kind of attitude. Why do we have to do it this way? You're expecting us, and maybe you're even making it a law. You're making it some kind of rule upon us Why do we have to do it this way? Don't you see how we're suffering or struggling because of these rules? Another kind of situation where we might face this is maybe even within the church, we feel the burden of someone's expectations. And and I hear just from the past, uh, from some people, uh, not necessarily in our church, but in other churches, uh, people see the pastor and they want to avoid the pastor. Oh, here comes a pastor. Oh, he might ask us to do something. Let's, let's kind of avoid him. Let's get away from him. Right? There's this burden that we might feel. Our title today is, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are free. The sons are free. And as you hear this, you might ask the question, what are we necessarily free from? But I want to ask the question, what is freedom? What is freedom? And so to understand this, we want to look at the passage today, and we want to jump right in just a little bit real quick. I want to to look at this beginning portion in verse 22 to verse 23. It describes Jesus talking about how he has to go to the cross again, um, and or not again, but he... He says this again. This is the second time that it's written in the book of Matthew where he predicts his death. And he tells his disciples that he has to be delivered into the hands of men and that they will kill him. And we've seen in in past uh, stories where uh, the disciples hear this and they might rebuke Jesus or they hear this and they might feel just kind of troubled about it. In today's passage, we see that they're greatly distressed. Jesus foretells his death that it is necessary, that it will happen, but the disciples didn't understand. For the Jews at this time, freedom, what it meant was that freedom is freedom from oppression, freedom from the Roman government. And so when they're thinking about freedom, they're thinking about how maybe the Messiah will come and free them from this oppression. And maybe for the disciples, they just, they just had this wonderful transfiguration experience and they thought, oh, maybe Jesus is going to free us now. And then they come down and then Jesus tells them again that 
there's this like battle with this demon and they couldn't cast it out and and then Jesus casts that casts it out and then they might have this thought oh maybe maybe Jesus is showing his power again and maybe there would be freedom from oppression but then uh, he goes on to to explain in today's passage that no the son of man will die this is going to happen and so they're greatly distressed. If, if you look at the original language, it says that they were saddened. And so this question comes up. Are we going to be free? Are we going to have freedom? And again, I want to ask the question, what does it mean to be free? And, and we'll also see why is it that Jesus has to die? And so... By the end of the sermon, I hope that we can answer these two questions. What does it mean to be free? And why did Jesus have to die? The main idea for today is that we need to live in the freedom that is in Jesus Christ. We need to live in the freedom that is in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about it with three ideas. The three ideas are freedom in God's law. Second is freedom from man's law. And third is true freedom in Jesus Christ alone. Okay, so once again, the main idea for today is live in freedom that is in Christ. And the first point is freedom in God's law. Second, freedom from man's law. And third, true freedom in Jesus Christ alone. All right, so the first point, freedom in God's law. We want to jump into the the next story here, starting in verse 24. It says, when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? Right, so as I'm reading this, and I was was studying this passage with the other pastors, um, first question that came to mind is, what's the two drachma tax? What is this all about? And one of the easiest ways to find the answer, if you don't know what the passage is talking about, one of the easiest ways is to have a Bible that may have cross-references. And so I looked at the cross-reference, and it pointed to Exodus chapter 30, verse 13. And if you look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, it talks about how the Israelites, they have to pay a shekel as an offering to the Lord. They had a census, and all of the people, the Israelites, uh, they had to pay half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Now, that helped some, but... Here, it's talking about two drachmas. In Exodus, it talks about uh, half a shekel. And so I'm like still a little bit confused. Uh, And and then so if if you're looking at the Bible and you're still not fully understanding what's going on, then another step that you can take is, of course, you can always ask people in the church or you can ask the pastor. You can ask your community group leader. uh, You can ask them and see what they say. Another resource that you can look at are commentaries. And so there are commentaries that are written to help explain what these passages are are talking about. And so I looked at some commentaries and what I found was that the two drachmas was equivalent to half a shekel. And that's why there's a cross reference pointing to that verse in Exodus chapter 30. So two drachmas was also equivalent to about a two days wages for a day laborer okay so two drachmas was equivalent to about two days wages for a day laborer all right so the tax is two days of working however much you earn for those two days that's how much the tax was now um, according to the commentaries the two drachma tax was something that all jews were required to pay on an annual basis. So this was a tax that was required uh, by, or it was, it was required of the Jews, and the purpose of this tax was to upkeep the temple and all the ongoings of the temple. And so when we look at this passage, it doesn't necessarily say a temple tax, but that's what it was. It was a tax that was received by people from Jews to upkeep the temple. It was not a government 
Roman tax. It was a Jewish temple tax. And so if you were to kind of apply that and, and think about what, what is that equivalent to, 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 to today? Well, maybe it's somewhat equivalent, not exactly, but it's somewhat equivalent to giving offering to the church today. Okay, now I want to explain that a little bit more, but it's, I want to say clearly it's not exactly the same. It's not, it's not even that close, but there is some similarity to it. Okay, and so uh, let's talk about the temple because when, when this uh this two drachma tax was brought up for the Jews. It has this whole background idea that needs to be explained in order for us to, ex- to understand what's going on in this passage. And so there was this tax to keep the temple uh, ministry continually going. So what was the temple all about? Now, we don't have a time to go into all the different details about what the temple was about, but it was a place for Jews to meet and worship God. And the way that they would worship God is that they would come and they would offer their sacrifices, uh, whether it be for their own sins, or there were some sacrifices or offerings that they gave for thanksgiving, or they were simply the daily practices, the daily offerings uh, that they gave. And so it was their way to meet with God. It was their way to come uh, before the Lord and to worship him. So they worship God in this way. Now, the way that they worshipped, the way that they worshipped was actually taught by God about how to worship. And so it was taught by God through the law that Moses brought about in the Old Testament. And so we go all the way back to the Old Testament and we find about we find out about all these different sacrifices and about exactly how they're supposed to be done. And so God made it clear that this is how you are supposed to live. This is how you are supposed to worship me. This is how you are supposed to live as a people of God. Now, if we think about God, and as we read in God's word, what we know from God's word is that God is a good God. God knows all things. And when God gives these laws... These laws are actually a good thing. Remember, the the first point is that there's freedom in God's laws. And so these laws are a good thing. Now, when we think about laws, sometimes we might think, oh, this is is a burden. I don't like this. Why do we have to do it this way? Um, And we we might have these, these complaints about why are things done in this particular way in Christianity? Why does the Bible say that we have to do it this way or that way? And so what what ends up happening is that we start to think about our own needs. And we try to think about freedom in a sense of how do I gain freedom from these laws? But there is an idea that I heard from a radio broadcast a while back um, and they were, they were a Christian radio broadcast, and there was a, a Christian military official who was talking about a Christian view of war and why war was something that we have to deal with, but there is a way to think about war in a Christian way. Now, the idea that they wanted to get to was that when there is war, the aim is to bring about freedom, and only Freedom, true freedom can only come about if there are boundaries. Laws have to be in place in order for there to be true freedom for all people. Why? Because a person themselves may say, I'm bound by this law and I don't like it. I want to express freedom myself. I want to do things whatever I want to, I want to do whatever I want to do. What ends up happening if a person does that? What if a person says, I want to, and we'll just use the most extreme example, I want to kill someone because I think that's, I enjoy that. I like that. I want to do that. I think it's right. And I think it's good for me to kill someone. Again, this is just an extreme example. If a person is allowed to do whatever they want and to express their freedom, what ends up happening is that the other person who gets killed ends up losing their freedom. 
And so what's the best way to have freedom for all people? What's the best way to have true freedom for all of mankind? It's to have certain laws in place. And the best way that God has for us to live was given to us through his law. God originally created this world so that we would have a world of happiness and joy and true freedom. But then the reason why we don't have that freedom today is because sin came into this world. And when sin came into this world, God still said, I want to have a relationship with people. I want to, for people to experience this joy and goodness that only I can bring them. And so he instituted, God brought this sacrificial system into the world through Moses. And so that if people are able to make sacrifices, then this is a way that somehow that they can begin to have a relationship with God. But we know that that, that wasn't uh, enough to bring about true freedom. Because even though people kept offering their sacrifices, they kept falling. Even though they kept offering sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, they kept falling. And so it wasn't the perfect sacrifice. There was still something that was needed. And so the sacrifice, the sacrificial system continued on all throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament, and this temple worship was necessary. And so that was, that was why there was this temple tax. And so when a person comes and says, hey, does your master, does your teacher not pay the tax? What was Peter's answer? Peter's answer is right away, yes, of course. Of course he pays. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, did Peter know how Jesus was going to answer? I mean, maybe, maybe Peter knew what Jesus did in the past. Maybe. It, it doesn't tell us uh, what Jesus did in the past. But all we know is that Peter just answered yes. The, the people that were coming to collect the tax came to Peter and not to Jesus. They came to Peter, and Peter answered right away, yes, he does. And without even knowing what Jesus might say, that's the answer that he gave. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, Jesus, he could have easily just paid the tax, right? Uh, or he could have just told them, uh, I don't need to pay the tax. Look at who I am, and, and we're going to get to that. He could have easily done that. But the story is here uh, because Jesus wanted to take this as an opportunity to teach his disciples. And it's an opportunity to teach us also about our relationship with these laws, our relationship with these expectations that we might face, especially about man's laws, right? God's laws were, were there, and it's supposed to, if we were to keep it perfectly, it would provide us freedom. But we keep falling, we keep failing. And then so all these Pharisees, they start to make all these laws, all these additional rules to those laws, and we've seen a lot of those cases in previous sermons. They make all these additional rules, and those rules begin to be what enslaves people. And so people begin to look for freedom from man's laws. Even this tax is a representation of, of this whole picture of the sacrificial system and all the rules that may have been added on. And so people, we, we desire to have freedom from this law that continues to point out our sin, from this law that continues to put a burden on us. And so we come to our second point, freedom from man's law. Jesus wants to make a point, and we're going to see his interaction with Peter. So here's, here's an interesting thing. Peter just answered yes. Right? No other words. He answered yes, and he starts heading into the house where Jesus was. Now, it doesn't say explicitly, 
But if we could imagine just a little bit, if you guys could uh, just imagine with me, what would Peter's thinking be? He, he was rebuked by Jesus. He was called Satan by Jesus not too long before, right? Um, and there was a situation where, where someone came and asked him, and there was this pressure. Don't you, doesn't your teacher pay taxes? There's this pressure to answer, oh, yes. And then so he's going into the house, and imagine what Peter might have been thinking. Maybe he was thinking, I need to go in and I need to tell Jesus that the tax collectors, the temple tax collectors are here. We need to pay the tax. I need to go in and tell Jesus. And what if Jesus says, uh, we're not going to pay the tax, but I told the people outside that, that Jesus does pay the tax. Oh, man, if Jesus doesn't pay the tax, then I'm going to feel ashamed. Like, I'm going to feel guilty because I told them that Jesus is going to pay the tax, but now it's like, I lied. Or, or maybe if Jesus uh, doesn't pay the tax, then those other people that, that I told the answer to, they're going to see me as a liar, or they're going to see me in a shameful way. And so, oh, there's just so much burden here. Jesus, you got to pay, otherwise I'm a liar. Or Jesus, you got to pay, otherwise uh, all these other people are going to see me as a bad person. So again, it doesn't necessarily say what Peter was thinking, but as Peter came in, Jesus knew right away what was happening, and he took this opportunity to talk with Peter. And so it says in verse 25, he, he said yes, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. He preemptively came in and asked Peter a question. What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And then Peter responds, from others. And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Let's think about what, what Jesus was saying here. Why, why does Jesus first speak to Peter? Well, Peter, well, Jesus wants to give uh, a lesson. He wants to teach his disciples a lesson what is that lesson? Well, he starts by speaking about this, this scenario, this, this story. He says, what do you think? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From his family members or from other people? And the answer is obvious. The king will receive taxes and he'll, he'll make people pay from all those people that aren't his family members. And so... Peter responds with, from others. And then the obvious next response that Jesus gives is, what about the sons then? What about the children of the king? Jesus says, the sons are free. If the king only taxes others, then those that belong to the household of the king are free from that kind of burden. What is Jesus saying? Well, as we've seen in previous sermons, Jesus has, has been declared to be the Son of God. Peter has declared to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Even in the transfiguration, a great cloud appears, and God the Father in his voice appears and says, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. Jesus says, I am the son of God. I am God the son. And so I am free. I don't need to pay that tax. And I don't need to pay and uh, I'm, not, I'm not burdened. I'm not bound to all the things that this tax represents. I don't have to offer sacrifices. And in fact, that's true because Jesus had no sin. There was no reason for him to offer the sin offering or the guilt offering. So Jesus was free from all those things. And so Jesus is saying to Peter, look, I don't have to pay anything. But then the interesting thing 
for us is that we could never say what Jesus said. We could never say that we were perfect like Jesus and so we're, that we're not bound to this sacrificial system. We have to admit that we fall into sin, that we fall short of God's law, that we commit crimes according to God's law. We're not perfect. And so the only result for us is that we're bound. We don't have freedom. And when we seek freedom, it's a selfish kind of freedom. When we complain about not having freedom, it's because we're looking out for what we want. We're thinking about ourselves. And so we're bound. And the only result that exists for us is punishment, is eternal punishment, because we've broken God's law. But here's the good news. Even though we're seeking freedom from man's laws, we cannot find that freedom on our own. But we can find true freedom. We can find true freedom through Jesus Christ alone. Here's the amazing thing. We are bound and we deserve punishment. But Jesus Christ has just told his disciples, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. Not only that, he will be raised on the third day. He will go to the cross and take the punishment that we deserve. And even though Jesus Christ had all the freedom, he didn't have to pay the tax. He didn't have to uphold the sacrificial system. But he submits himself to it. He says, even though I am free, I will allow myself to be bound so that those that believe in Jesus Christ who were bound can be set free. And this happens not only through the death of Jesus Christ, but through a miracle that happens with the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this is what's amazing. The story doesn't stop with Jesus saying, then the sons are free. And saying, look, I'm free. He doesn't stop there. Peter could have said, oh, okay, great, Jesus. Good for you. You're free. I'm still bound. Right? Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on. And in verse 27, he says, however, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Through this miracle, what Jesus does is he upholds the sacrificial system and says, I will uphold it. It's still necessary, but I will be the one that's bound to it. I submit myself to it. I do it willingly. But also through this miracle, this freedom is not just for me. It's not just to declare that I am already free and that I will submit myself to being bound, but it's also declare, to declare that you will also be set free. The good news is that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and it talks about this in other passages in Scripture, that we ourselves are also called children of God and that we are also set free. And so that's why it says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And again in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What it's saying here is that we are called to freedom. But it's not freedom just the way that we want to live. 
but it's freedom according to God's law. We are free to live according to God's ways so that all people can experience, all people that trust in Jesus Christ can experience true freedom. It's a freedom from the the weightiness of the law. It's a freedom from the guilt and the shame that we might feel from not being able to achieve the law. It's a freedom that only Jesus Christ can give to us. And here's the wonderful thing about Jesus. Jesus doesn't expect us to have full understanding right away. Jesus doesn't expect us to have like this radical faith right away. It says here, however, not to give offense to them. However, not to stumble them. I'm going to show grace. I'm going to show kindness. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to condemn what they're doing. In order not to offend them, go ahead, Peter. Go and see this miracle happen and pay that tax. And through paying that tax, perhaps we are upholding the law so that Christ would submit to it And when he submits to it and dies on the cross for our sins, it provides an opportunity for those people that are collecting taxes, for those people that are upholding the sacrificial system, for those people to be set free. What does that mean for us today? Through our series, we've been talking about all the ways that Jesus Christ is showing himself to be the Messiah. How there is really freedom through Jesus Christ. And through our series, we've been talking about how there are all kinds of laws, all kinds of rules that people make, maybe all kinds of expectations that we, that we might even have of each other. And not to say that those expectations are always bad. Jesus didn't condemn the tax. Not to say that all those expectations are bad. Actually, some of those expectations might be good. But it's how we respond to those expectations. That's what brings about the guilt. That's what brings about the shame. If I'm not able to live up to an expectation, then I might fear what that person might think of me. And because I fear, I might only try to do the very minimum just to be able to meet that expectation. And I feel bound to try to meet that expectation. Again, that expectation in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's my attitude toward it. It's my heart. And why do I do that? I do that because I want to be set free. I want to find my own way to be free from this person's condemnation against me. I want that person to see me in a good way. Or I want to show myself to people that I'm a good person. But as long as people have these expectations on me, I have to do my best to try to find that kind of freedom, to try to try to make people see that I'm a good person and to feel like everything is okay for me. The only way we could find freedom from this type of thing is if we look to Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Look to him. He's the only one in whom we can find hope in this life. He's the only one in whom we can find freedom. And even in a time like this coronavirus, where we feel bound, maybe, to our masks, or other people around the world, they feel bound to their homes. The only way that we can really find freedom is through Jesus Christ. Why? Because remember all that guilt and shame that we might feel from trying to find our own freedom? Jesus has paid the price to take care of all that guilt and all that shame. And if we look to Jesus Christ, we don't have to try to lift our own selves up anymore. Jesus says, because of me, you are a child of God. Trust me. Trust in what I did, because if you do, you are a child of God. 
You don't have to try to prove yourself to other people. God already sees you as his own. And you don't have to feel guilty about all the wrongs that you do. Whether it's the past sins or present sins or even the future sins, you don't have to feel guilty about those things because Jesus Christ already paid the price on the cross for you. So there's true freedom only through Jesus Christ. So here's a very practical thing that I want to call all of us to do. Think about the gospel again. Think through what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. And when you face those situations where you feel shame, or you feel, where you feel guilt, think upon Jesus Christ and how he's already taken care of that guilt for you. How Jesus Christ has already made you a child of God through what he accomplished. Think about that. And let that bring about freedom in your own hearts so that you don't have to feel bound to try to gain your own freedom. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ again. And for those of you that have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're still trying to figure out what Christianity is, you're still trying to understand what the gospel really is about, I want to speak to you. Keep asking questions. Keep learning about the Bible. Keep learning about Jesus Christ. Because I can guarantee you, because I really believe what the Bible says, I can guarantee you there will be freedom when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. There will be freedom. Let's pray together. Take a moment now to, to go before the Lord and pray. And whatever God is placing on your heart today, take a time to reflect on that. And perhaps it might be a prayer of confession. Perhaps it might be a prayer of thanksgiving. Perhaps it might be a prayer of just wanting to reflect and think about the Lord once again and just, just asking the Lord to keep reminding you of the gospel. Or maybe for some of you it might be the case that for the first time you're going to the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saying, I want that hope. I want that freedom. I want you, Lord Jesus. I want to trust you. Whatever it is on, that's on your heart, take some time to pray right now, and then we'll sing a song together, and then I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray together.